All right, good afternoon, everyone. We are going to get started here in just a second. Uh, first of all, want to uh, make a quick introduction. This is Shelley Wilkinson with uh, Tricom Funding. I'm the Director of Sales here. Tricom is pleased to introduce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of the series is to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. Our presenter today is John Walters. John is currently the Vice President of Business Development for Insurance Applications Group, LLC, the company that designed and markets the Essential Staff Care Benefits Program. John was hired eight years ago as the Director of Business Development, and since taking that position, ESC has dramatically increased its client base every year to make Essential Staff Care the largest benefits program for temporary agencies in the nation. Now with over 500 staffing companies as clients and over half a million temporaries enrolling annually, ESC has been recognized as one of the fastest growing businesses for Inc. Magazine's 500, 5,000 for the last three consecutive years. ESC has also been awarded both the Golden Eagle Award and the Soaring Eagle Awards over the last three years from the National Association of Health Underwriters. With the election behind us, the Affordable Care Act is slated to move forward. In today's Industry Insider webinar, John will discuss what steps a staffing firm should take now over the next six months and what needs to be in place prior to 2014 to prepare for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, including lar large or small employer calculation, using the look-back rule to pay or to play, cost of paying or playing, private and public exchanges, and covering your options. By the end of the session, you'll know the step-by-step -step process to making the decisions necessary to navigate health care reform. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the chat feature located on the right toolbar and submit questions to all panelists. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. So with this, I am going to turn the floor over to John. Well, thank you so much, Shelley. I uh, really appreciate the intro there. Looks like we're going to have to update it for next year because uh, getting toward the end of the year for us, looks like we've added on about 127 new clients just this year alone. So that will have to change. Uh, today, uh, this week has definitely been the week of webinars for everybody. Uh, ASA had their uh, wonderful presentation on Tuesday and we gave an industry-wide one yesterday, and, and this one is uh, uh, for, uh, you know, to round the week off, so to speak. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today we're going to uh, talk about the post-election update and what are the next steps for staffing firms. Uh, Shelly did a great job of going over who we are, so I'll just skip that there and go to the official disclaimer. Uh, basically, just letting everyone know I am an insurance professional. Uh, I am not a legal professional. So if you have a specific question uh, you know, to your specific business, uh, we, of course, would highly recommend that you seek out your own legal counsel uh, to uh, ask questions about your specific business situation. Um, Shelly also went over some of the topics we're going to be covering, um, uh, the first three steps, and then we're going to go into uh, talking about what your options are and look at some of the cost of paying versus playing and some of the things that are out there. Um, what we at Essential Staff Care like to do, uh, you know, uh, so a lot of folks have a lot of information out there about the legal aspects of it. We are now uh, two going on to three years into the Affordable Care Act, so people should start being a little bit more familiar with a lot of the rules. But uh, what our purpose in developing these webinars and these presentations for clients and our and and uh, uh, prospects and is basically to educate everyone where the insurance market at, is at uh, in all this at this time. All right. Uh, first thing to make sure to get it out of the way is that the PPACA, which is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, is uh, without a doubt the law of the land. Um, it's been passed by Congress, signed by the president, has been challenged and upheld in court, and of course, the president has been recently reelected. Um, the legal argument is settled. However, 
for, uh, estimated 40% of the law is still yet to be defined or clarified. Um, we're getting new regulations out almost on a weekly or sometimes a bi-weekly uh, 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 schedule there. There was uh, the so-called Thanksgiving surprise, which, uh, of course, a lot of people wouldn't uh, have known about because it primarily addressed carriers, and there was some information on deductibles and things of that nature. Um, but just be prepared. There still are going to be very, a lot of changes and modifications over the coming months prior to 2014. Uh, the estimation is that, uh, you know, they don't like to do any rulings, uh, you know, up until we expect a, basically a flurry of rulings to come up up until about June of next year. Uh, uh, usually they like uh, to have any new modifications to the law to at least to be six months or longer before the law goes, is scheduled to go into effect in January of 2014. And um, so we're expecting a lot, uh, a lot of more things to come down between now and next summer. So what are your next steps on how to prepare? Step one. The first thing everybody has to do is figure out whether or not you're going to be defined as a large or a small employer. Uh, that is very important. Uh, we feel the majority of staffing companies uh, uh, and the way they do business will be considered large, but uh, a lot of people are going to be in that gray area. So this is how you figure that out. Because if you are a small employer below 50 full-time equivalents. Now, there, there's going to be a lot of discussion between full-time employees and full-time equivalents. The equivalence calculation is only for this large or small employer calculation. If you are 50 full, if you are basically 49.9 uh, equivalents or under, you are exempt from the health care laws, regulations, and taxes. If you are deemed a large employer, which we believe a, the majority of staffing firms will be, um, you are going to be subject to all PPACA regulations and taxes. Here is how to do that calculation. Your full-time equivalents are calculated as the total number of hours worked by all employees, full-time and part-time, for each month. Then you divide up all hours for that month by 120. This will give you the number of full-time equivalents for that calendar month. You do this calculation over the coming 12 months and then divide that total by 12 and that average determines if you are subject to the health care reform law or not. Again, if you are 50 or over, you are subjected to the law. Here's a couple of things to keep in mind about this calculation. Anybody that is full-time or, or happens to have more than 120 hours in a given month, you just cap their count at the 120. Please make sure you're doing that. If you've got some salaried in, internal folks and they're pulling in 130, 140, 150 hours a month, cap them at 120 because that will um, you know, uh, uh, change your calculation there. So your full-time hours for those folks are capped at 120 for the month for the purpose of the calculation. If you do have bona fide, properly classed, independent contractors that you work with, they, their hours are not counted in your calculation. So basically for your internal and full-time folks and all your temporary staff, you add up all of their hours for each month. The large and small employer determination occurs in the preceding year. So the first time you really have to worry about this is, is next year. Your 2013 calculation is your determining factor for 2014. If you are one of those companies in that gray area where you're close to the 50 full-time equivalents, you may have to keep continue, continuing to do this calculation each year because literally if you don't have a whole lot of hours one year, that could make you exempt from the law for the next year. So keep that in mind. All right. Something to be said again about hours. So generally, we get a lot of questions about what about vacation pay, overtime hours, whatever. Hours in this calculation are hours. If you pay a person for a, an hourly wage, no matter what reason it is, for his vacation or whatever, you count that in your calculation. Hours are hours. There is no 
you know, well, what about this hour, overtime, anything like that? Just all hours or hours go into the calculation. All right. Once you've defined finally and, and completely that whether or not you're a large or smaller uh, employer, if you're a small employer, you have nothing to worry about. You can pretty much well ignore the rest of this presentation. If you're a large employer, this is what the rest of, rest of the presentation will be for because your next step is you have to utilize the look back rule. Okay. Originally, the ACA's definition of a full-time employee was 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month. The penalties are and still are calculated monthly. This would have cost the staffing industry hundreds of millions of dollars in new taxes. Um, this would have been the part of the law that most staffing companies feared when the law was first passed. So the look-back rule was aggressively pursued by the American Staffing Association and a coalition of industries such as retail, restaurant, and other associations. I cannot give the American Staffing Association enough credit because the, the, this law, this ruling, uh, really did uh, uh, make this very bitter pill a little bit easier to swallow. All right. The look-back rule was formulated for a number of reasons. It was formulated to give employers flexibility by permitting them to adopt reasonable procedures, determine which of their employees are truly full-time without becoming liable for the tax payment. But it was also put in place to protect employees from the unnecessary costs, confusion, and disruption of coverage, um, you know, basically coming, being covered one month, not covered another month, and then also to minus, minimize the burdens that would have put on the affordable insurance exchanges or the state exchanges. All right. Uh, special thanks again to Ed Lentz and ASA for going uh, out of their way and, and pursuing this for the staffing industry. But basically, you can see by this graph during the old rule, practically uh, uh, in a standard 500 temporary uh, 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 staffing company, probably closer to 90% of them you would have been taxed on on a monthly basis. With the new uh, look-back rule of 1,560 hours over a 12-month period, you get to exclude a significant number of your workforce for the purposes of this calculation. All right, so how do we do it? Here's some quick facts about the look-back rule. All right, employers have the flexibility to choose a look-back period anywhere from 3 to 12 months. But, of course, we wouldn't understand why pretty much, well, any staffing company would not want the longest possible period, uh, you know, of 12 months to reduce that number of people who will qualify as full-time. Um, employers will need to decide our own if a shorter period works for their particular business needs. Um, the next thing to know, worry about is the upcoming stability period. Here's a little rule to remember that for you. First, have your look-back period, and that will follow a stability period. Your stability period can be no shorter than six months in any case, and it must coincide with the length of the measurement period. For example, you could have a three-month look-back period and a six-month stability period. That's okay, as well as a 12-month look-back and a 12-month stability period. But you could not do a three and three, or you couldn't do a nine or a six. Okay, So those are examples of what works and what doesn't work. The other thing that is very important to note uh, in the IRS notice that defined the look-back rule is that there is a new definition of employee class called the variable hour employee. Uh, I apologize in advance for the language of how this definition is written, but this is word for word from the IRS notice. The definition, according to the IRS, is if at the time of hire, an employee cannot be reasonably determined to work on average 30 hours a week or if based on the facts and circumstances at the start date, the period of employment at those 30 hours a week is reasonably expected to be of limited duration. And it cannot be determined that an employee is going to expect it to work an average of 30 hours a week over their initial measurement period. Some things, very important things to keep in mind there. The variable hour employee definition is, is a, certainly a definition that was uh, coined for the nature of temporary staffing. However, in a lot of circumstances, you're going to have uh, contracts and clients that are predominantly uh, could be long-term. Let's say you have a class of employees or you have a particular client 
that uh, employees work it there pretty much, well, 40 hours a week for a couple of years. In that case, you have to be very careful. Now, honestly, you never know if that employee is going to work out. But if they're hired full-time for a long period of time, close or at that 12-month stage, you may want to go ahead and decide that that person is a full-time employee just to be on the safe side. Because if the Department of Labor comes back and says, you hired this person for a full-time position, and this full-time position is going to long for 12 months and and could potentially go longer, well, we don't think you could reasonably determine that that was a variable hour employee. So be very careful there. But, uh, you know, uh, again, this definition for new employee class should cover the majority of temporary, especially high turnover-like assignments. All right. The look-back period definition. Uh, The way the IRS defines the look-back period, they actually call it the measurement period. So you will hear those terms interchangeably. It could be either look-back or measurement. Again, it's the 3- to 12-month period of time used to track employee hours. Um, The period is used to determine if employees be classified as either full-time or not full-time. If an employee worked 1,560 hours or more, during a 12-month measurement period, they would be deemed a full-time employee for either tax or coverage purposes. Now, they're supposed to work over the 12-month period, but let's say they you have an employee that may hit nine hit, hit the 1,560 hours in nine months. Well, a lot of things could happen there. It would depend on when his breaks and actual work. Uh, uh, is actually taking place. Uh, If he works three months, off a month, another three months, off a month, but he's pretty much well still employed at that 12 months and he hit hit his 1,560 hours, well, he is definitely going to be considered a full-time employee. But let's say an employee hits, you know, uh, close to 1,500 hours, uh, is on a 10-month contract, and is not working that last two months. Well, he's not really an employee, so he may or may not count depending on whether or not he's actually an employee uh, after that 12 months. The next period of time that you'll worry about on on this look-back rule is what's called your administrative period. This is a limited up to 90 days period of time um, uh, after or coinciding with the measurement period. Uh, This period of time is used to compile the data on the employees that work during their measurement or look-back periods and identify who they are. If they're a temporary employee and they're variable hour employees, the administrative period combined with the measurement period can never exceed 13 months before coverage would uh, become effective if they're determined to be full-time. A true full-time hire, you're hiring somebody for your internal staff, Um, they're truly a full-time, they're not going to be subjected to a look-back period. So it's very important that those distinctions are made. If you're hiring somebody for your internal staff or another full-time position, they don't really get a look-back period. If you offer coverage, they're pretty much only subjected to a max 90-day administrative period. So make sure your employees are classed correctly before you determine whether or not you're going to do a look-back period. Again, the look-back period is only going to be for those variable hour employees. Following both the measurement and the administrative period is what's called the stability period. This is the 6- to 12-month period of time after both of those periods. A variable hour employee that was deemed full-time during the previous 12-month measurement period will be considered a full-time employee for the next 12-month stability period, regardless of how many hours that employee actually work during the time frame as long as he or she remains employed. Uh, but the reverse of that is also true. If they work the initial 12 months, uh, if they didn't meet the requirements, they're not deemed full-time, well, they're not going to be deemed full-time for their stability period as well. All right? So from there, I've got a couple of charts for you. The two main types of employees that you have to worry about for 2014 are your ongoing employees, basically who is going to be determined full-time as of January 1, 2014, and of course, your newly hired variable hour employees. The definition of an ongoing employee is any employee that is currently on your payroll that has currently met 
a standard measurement or look back period. So basically, if they are hired on January 1 of 2013, okay, they're hired this January 1st, and they work the 1,560 hours for all 12 months, then on starting on January 1, 2014, they're really only going to be subjected to a three-month administrative period. All right. So if they're deemed full time as of January 1 and you do not offer them benefits, you must either pay the tax on them or they must uh, have be enrolled uh, in coverage by that end of that 90 day waiting period. Well, how are you also going to track someone that is hired in, let's say, June of 2013? Another good question. You're going to have to track that employee's hours. Let's just look at this chart again. Assume for a moment that an employee was hired in June. Well, you track them for the next 12 months, and in June of 2014, you will determine whether or not they're full-time or not. If they are full-time uh, as of June, then you've got your administrative period, and you either start paying the tax on them or uh, you know, providing them coverage. The next example is how to deal with new hires. Let's again assume that you have, uh, and this is kind of how you will be doing it going forward, all right? An employee is hired any time in January uh, of next year, but for this example, we're saying January 1, just to keep the example simple. Hire them on January 1, 2014. They're going to have to work their full 12 months in 2014. Your administrative, and this it, this example covers that 13th, month uh, uh, situation in regards to administrative periods. Your administrative period would technically start at the beginning of November. In the beginning of November, you'll start tracking and compiling all the data of everybody that was hired uh, on January 1, 2014. You get the last two months of 2014 as a part of the administrative period, but if they're deemed full-time employees, after their end of their 12 months, their coverage must be effective by January 31st. All right. So, uh, and just basically, it's going to be a rolling example as people are hired throughout 2014. Again, the law doesn't go into effect until January 1, 2014. So, you will have to have this in place and start tracking employee hours as they are hired throughout 2014, assuming you're going to do a 12 month look back rule. All right. You're going to use the look back rule. You can go ahead and use it now. Uh, and let's start doing some um, data uh, uh, calculations, uh, looking at employee hours. And go ahead and look from your previous years. Use 2012, 2011, 2010 um, to estimate your full-time employees, kind of what you're doing now. And this will give you an idea of what your potential tax penalty exposure is. Or if you're going to offer coverage, you very much in particular have to do your look back rule and you will need to uh, uh, apply that rule and identify who those particular employees are. <coughs> Excuse me. Basically, you're going to have to have this for census information. Um, census information and typically three years claims experience is required for quotes from, from the majority of, of the major carriers. All right. So you're going to identify who those people are if you're intending on offering uh, major medical qualified coverage to them. Step three, after you completed, uh, completed your look back rules, you start getting an idea of how many full-time employees that you really have. Your next step is really going to be having to decide whether or not you're going to pay or to play. Again, if you're a large employer over the 50 full-time equivalents, not 50 full-time employees, but 50, but assuming if you had 50 full-time employees, you're obviously going to have 50 full-time equivalents, um, you're going to be required by law to either offer a qualified health plan to all your full-time employees to play, in other words, or you have to pay a penalty on each full-time employee. There are many considerations employers have to take into account besides the financial ones. The cost of paying, the tax penalty for not offering a qualified health plan is $166.67 per month on each full-time employee less the first 30. So if they're determined to be full-time, 
your penalty is that 166 or a lot of people like to use the $2,000 per year. It all equates to that. So basically the 166 or two grand a year on each full-time employee minus the first 30. Okay. The, for some reason in the law, you get to uh, not count your first 30. Uh, there's a previous question, and actually with a lot of our clients, uh, this has come up. A lot of those folks that are in that small to mid-sized gray area, they may be de uh, deemed to be a large employer because of their uh, they have a, quite a number of part-time employees. But once they start identifying who their full-time employees are by the look-back rule, they're either close or actually may be less than 30. Well, at this point, our opinion is, since the law gives you the first 30 for free, if for some reason you're under that 30 of full-timers, if you're in that gray area, you're pretty much not, well, not, not going to have a tax penalty. Okay? Uh, employees that are not offered coverage, they're going to have that coverage available from the subsidized state exchanges. If an employee doesn't pick up the coverage, they face individual mandate penalties. Another thing about the, the tax penalty here, the tax penalty is scheduled to increase, but the tax penalty is indexed to the rise in basic health care premiums or the consumer price index. So in our opinion, because the tax penalty increases are indexed to the rise uh, in the cost of premiums of health care, the tax is always may be a little bit less than what the cost of premiums are, depending on how premium inflation goes. All right. Some of the advantages of taking the payer out. You're going to have much lower or no administrative costs comparatively. Okay. It's going to be a lot easier to budget based on your penalties and costs are directly going to be tied in to the increase or decrease in your full-time employees. Compared to the average national employer contributions for non-staffing groups, and we have the chart and the source where we get this from, the tax penalty is less expensive, even, even with premiums being tax deductible. So at this time, it appears the pay option uh, appears to be less of a financial, regulatory, and administrative burden compared to offering coverage in a lot of cases. Right? Some of the disadvantages of paying. It could weaken your employer-employee bond if coverage was certainly previously offered. Non-discrimination rules, and that is a big if. They have not come down yet on what the non-discrimination rules are going to be. That could seriously affect your decision. But also, what about your market considerations? What type of employees are in your workforce? Are you more of a higher-paid, longer-term workforce? Well, that's going to factor in significantly to what your situation is. It's going to be easier. Um, uh, it may very well be a lot safer to get some uh, uh, you know, major medical coverage for those employees. But again, what if you're lower wage and have a much higher turnover workforce? That's seriously going to affect your decision. And, of course, all importantly, what do your clients want, all right? So we're going to get into some of those things in the strategic considerations part a little bit later, all right? The cost of playing. Uh, playing means offering a qualified MEC health plan. Many factors are going to play into this decision of whether or not you're going to offer this to all your full-time employees for your clients. Not only does the new law introduce many new administrative, regulatory, and fiduciary burdens, this law certainly affects both employers and the private insurance carriers to a substantial degree more than any other two types of parties. In regards to the staffing industry, the nature of the industry itself has always been a challenge. An hourly wage, typically assignment-based workforce, makes it difficult at this time to predict, predict if affordable, op affordable options are going to be available. With the look-back rule to determine your actual full-time employers, carriers can now finally identify a potential pool of employees in consideration for coverage. All right? Carrier requirements and actuarial considerations will apply. All right. Here's a chart. This is the most recent 2012 Kaiser Fi uh, Family Foundation study. This is the average cost broken down between employees and employers uh, and what the costs are average. Uh, and, again, this is all industries and uh, not particular to staffing by any means. 
the auto wouldn't even think a number of staffing companies would have been included in, a, in an analysis like this because of the historically low participation. But you can see there the top four primary types of plans out there, what the coverage is, uh, the, what the employees typically pay, what employers typically pay. The number I, well, I mainly want to show you is the, the average of all those plans at the bottom, all plans. Pretty much, well, the total cost of health care, providing a benefit plan for a single employee is about $5,600 a year. You see it's about $4,600 um, uh, for the employer contribution versus about closer to $1,000. Again, these are national averages. All right. Another thing that the Kaiser Family Foundation, again, this is their most recent data they've just released, okay? It shows the premium costs in health care over the last 10 years. We just thought this was a very significant and powerful piece of information for employers to keep in mind and consider. All right. This is the increase of everything, how what it was in 2002, the way it currently is in 2012. All right. Some of the advantages of playing. You can maintain or increase your employer recruiting and retention abilities. And of course, primarily maintain any and all historical benefits with offering an employer-sponsored health coverage plan. But some of the disadvantages. What is the plan going to cost if you're able to offer one? Do you think that cost is going to increase or decrease in the future? That's a very good question. We do not know at this point. All right. Certainly, you're going to have carrier requirements to offer coverage. Um, whatever the cost of the new administrative, regulatory, reporting, and fiduciary responsibility. But the last thing to keep in mind, and this has been a very hot topic on the number of calls we've had with clients, is what if somebody's competing against you and they have less expensive rates by only paying the tax? That is a big question and a big worry out there that we've been seeing. All right. Last but not least, the non-discrimination rule I previously mentioned. It is a part of the Affordable Care Act, but it has been tabled due to the implications. Uh, the word we're getting, um, <coughs> excuse me, the word we're getting was that um, once people started looking at it, they realized some of the non-discrimination rules were, weren't enforced uh, uh, equally and consistent, consistently. There are some descriptions, uh, uh, discretions in there that. Uh, for whatever reason, this is a very important part of your decision, and there has been nothing said on it yet. So everybody, carriers, employers, uh, everybody with the, with the highest stakes involved in this are wondering what the non-discrimination rules are going to be. If it is enforced as, a, as it's currently written, then it's going to require an all-or-nothing sort of solution to offer to your employees. Employers are going to have the option, uh, you're going to have to either offer the same group health plan or number of plans to all of your full-time employees, or you may be forced to drop your plan for all employees and send everybody to the exchanges. Uh, again, this may mean if you have an internal uh, plan for those internal employees or nothing or some other type of plan for your temporary workforce. The non-discrimination rule is going to be a big factor in your decision, so uh, the longer they wait, the more antsy everybody is, is, is getting on this. All right. At a glance, basically calculate whether or not you're a large employer. Then you're going to have to, you know, once you calculate your large employer status, then you're going to choose basically whether you're going to offer or don't offer. And then just keep in mind some of the things you're going to have to do to either pay or play. All right. A couple another way to say this is one. Um, some of your options if you're going to pay or play. But, again, note that all options involve paying something, all right? You can either offer, one, minimum essential coverage plan only to, say, your 10 internal employees, all right? Uh, but that really is going to depend on how the non-discrimination rule comes out, all right? Offer the MEC to all your full-time employees, including um, uh, any new full-time temporaries, all right, or you're going to have to decide to drop the health plan completely and send employees to the exchange for coverage. All right, let's get into uh, you know a lot of the the new terms that have been popping up with the uh, invention of the state exchanges. We are now seeing a uh, a, a rash of private exchanges uh, coming out there. Essential Staff Care has actually developed one as well. Um, things to know about the exchanges. Um, 
employers of a certain size and, of course, individuals will have access to coverage from either the private insurance market or now the state exchanges. All right. This is certainly introduces a new dynamic in the insurance market, and how it all will end up playing out is very uncertain at this time. Insurance is still very much a state-to-state -state affair, so regulations, mandates, and availability could vary greatly depending on what state or states you do business in. All right. So please keep that in mind. Uh, you know, those folks in, say, Alabama will probably have access to a wide different uh, uh, selection of plans and rates compared to uh, companies uh, in California, for example. All right. Private exchanges. The definition of an exchange is an organized marketplace or center for trading or purchasing securities or, or merchandise. Um, private exchanges are emerging as marketplaces for health insurance and other related products uh, uh, promoted by private industry stakeholders, uh, payors, brokers, benefits consultants, folks like that, um, generally with options for employers to administer defined contribution arrangements. But that's going to be in change now for a lot of different reasons. Um, we sourced this from one of the best analytical firms in the country. They have uh, released a very recent report on exchange, uh, Booz & Company, and we will have that. But here were some of the tidbits out of the Booz & Company report on these new exchanges. There's going to be two primary types of, of, of private health insurance exchanges. Well, you're going to have multiple carrier exchanges and what's called single carrier exchanges. The things to keep in mind, of, apparently, uh, you know, based on this analysis from the Booz and Company, is that the multiple carrier changes are basically going to have uh, weak regional followers. It's going to be what are a lot of brokers and benefits consultants. It's going to have a number of different carriers in there and pick and choose, but it's probably not going to be a lot of uh, very well-known carriers. Then you're going to see strong single carrier exchanges uh, emerge. Um, these exchanges are promoted by a single payor or insurance company, and they're going to target employers that wish to maintain some role in choosing both the insurance carrier and the plan design. If you notice uh, above in the multiple carrier exchanges, is uh, this is going to be more for those employers that just want to take a total hands-off approach uh, to how things are going to work for the health insurance market. All right. Last but not least are the new state or public exchanges. All right, Individuals, not employers now, but individuals, employees, if they're not covered under an employer or some type of state, federal, or other type of program uh, or dependent coverage uh, for, some, for something, basically their spouse and their spouses uh, uh, covering them, uh, their employers, if they don't, are not covered, they now have access to subsidized coverage from state exchanges. Individuals face somewhat low penalties currently for not having coverage. Uh, there is no pre-existing condition limitation on plans anymore. So theoretically, employees could indeed wait until they're sick before purchasing coverage. We think that is going to be one of those unintended consequences that is going to cause some problems later on down the road. Each state is going to have a wide amount of flexibility on the setup for its, its exchanges. They can decide whether or not to have a state exchange at all and make the federal government do one. Approximately 16 states have decided not to implement their own exchanges at this time. What plans must cover in addition to the federal MEC requirements? The states have a ton of flexibility. The MEC requirements from the federal government, when they are finally defined, is basically going to be a floor. So this is what we mean by plan designs and rates can vary greatly because states have flexibility on what they want those uh, plans to cover. Uh, the states can decide what carriers or you know what number of them will participate in their state exchange. What other types of plans can be offered in their dental, vision, what employer sizes they're going to allow. PPACA currently limits it to under 100, but the, the states have some flexibility to, to mess with that. Um, again, the key to remember here is the flexibility of each state uh, has on making those options and uh, for individuals employers will vary greatly. A big question that we're starting to come up against in the insurance carrier market is, whether or not employers are going to be forced to compete with their state exchanges on benefit offerings. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is what if in a certain state, based on their rules, 
the plans you're able to get as an employer aren't as rich or a heck of a lot more expensive than what folks can get out of the state exchange. You know, in those scenarios, are are you going to be competing with the state exchange for your employee benefits? A very big question that there really hasn't been an adequate answer to yet. All right. Here's some of the exchange decisions. This is a uh, statehealthfacts.org uh, from November 19th. Um, so this is as current as we have on what states are, are basically defaulting to the federal exchange, whether or not they've decided or, or if they've already declared that they're going to make a state-based exchange. Uh, back again to the individual mandate, just like to show this for what the penalties are. And this is a yearly penalty. Um, depending on which uh, a percentage of the federal poverty level they are at, their yearly earnings and what that matches up to be, their penalty is 1%, and you'll see what their penalty is for the year, okay, uh, based on right, uh, right there. That's a pretty low penalty that's going to be taken off of someone's tax uh, uh tax forms or their rebates or whatever versus actually going out and pay, picking up and paying their employee contribution on either a state exchange or employer plan. Uh, that's why we say there's really not a whole lot of incentives for folks out there to really buy the coverage because the penalty doesn't look that high compared to the price of a major medical program. All right. Covering your options. Um, you're either going to pay or to play. Or could the insurance market figure out some type of option in between? Um, you know, we aren't doing this as a sales pitch, but uh, as since we focus on the staffing industry, these are some of the things we're developing. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, creating next generation staffing products for the temporary and variable hour products. We're developing new self-funded, a major med option for those folks that, that uh, need it. And then, of course, we're going to try to uh, come up, we're coming up with a defined contribution advantage, a somewhat in-between scenario. All right. Um, that's just kind of what they're designed for. I basically just said that there. The defined contribution is the in-between. It's basically for staffing as well as other industries. Our other two are going to be specifically for staffing. Some of the strategic considerations that you have to keep in mind. If you're going to play, we highly recommend you make friends with a good ERISA attorney because, uh, again, this we're talking a 2,700-page bill and currently, currently 16,000 uh, pages of regulations. And, again, 40% of the law has still yet to be defined. So this is going to be a pretty – uh, a tricky maze to navigate. So make sure you have someone that is very good at this advising you for your specific business needs. Whether you decide to pay or to play, whatever you decide to do there, spread the cost of either the coverage or the tax penalties among all of your temporary workforce. The companies that have a low ratio of full-time versus not full-time are going to have a financial advantage over those companies with a large, large full-time workforce, right? Again, this ties in a, a basically to the need for temporary staffing. We still see that as being quite strong. Remember, your clients and everybody else are in the same regulatory boat facing the same cost and the same decisions you are. You, as a staffing firm, will have the advantage of spreading your increased labor costs amongst your part-time workforce. Your clients will not have that advantage. If they pick up a new employee, they have to be full-time, so that has to be the full amount of the decision for them. The reason a lot of clients use staffing firms is because their workforce is, is in a lot of ways cheaper than hiring somebody full-time. Use that to your advantage. Okay? Address those market considerations based on what your client needs or wants. Do your clients want low turnover or do they want cheaper labor costs? All right, that's what the conversations you're going to start having to have with your clients now, okay? Um, <clears throat> hey, do you want Fred there year in, year after? Well, well that's going to cost more, and that's going to cost you this amount. If you don't care that it's Fred or not that's working there year in, year out, and you want the cheapest possible rate, well, we're going to replace that person on, on a more 
uh, you know, common basis there to keep the prices low. You're going to have to do whatever you decide to do based on where you are in the market and what you think your clients need. Start having these conversations. Are your clients asking you to be compliant? Okay. This takes a little bit of client education there. The law allows you to either pay or to play. Either option, you are compliant. It does not going to matter one way. At the end of the day, it's going to cost your client more either way. Your clients are going to have to pay more. How much more depends on what you know they want as compliant and what you mean as compliant. The client education on, on, on what's compliant or not will be key to your discussions. Again, go back to that earlier question. You want lower t- turnover or you want cheaper labor costs? If you want these people covered, well, We're going to have to factor that in. All right. Last strategic uh, considerations. CFOs are more likely to be involved in making the company health care decisions now than HR. This is all due to the increased regulatory and fiduciary responsibilities involved. You now have the IRS as the enforcement agency. You now have a substantial tax penalty where you did not have before. So uh, your HR person, you know, uh, decisions we're seeing being made now are coming down from the CFOs. We're getting those calls, uh, you know, those are a lot more detailed calls than we are from, say, the HR person that was just interested in what the benefit offerings were. All right. The decision to play and offer coverage will likely depend on the availability and the affordability of coverage compared to the relatively easier option of paying a monthly penalty. To summarize, again, let's go over the three steps. Step one, are you a large or small employer? Step two, establish your look-back rule. Identify full-time employees based on your rule. There could be changes to the look-back rule in 2015, so whatever strategies you may implement uh, may have to adjust slightly. The look-back rule will help you either estimate your tax penalties or you have to do it to identify who the full-time people are so they can be offered benefits. Step three, deciding to pay or play is a decision you have to make over the coming months. Identifying employees in 2013, obtaining quotes for coverage, implementing that coverage or not, complying with the new regulatory requirements, all of this has to take place prior to the end of 2013, depending on what you're going to do. Many considerations must be taken into account. What your client needs, what market you serve, um, the increased cost that you're going to have to uh, you know, spread throughout your workforce, the strategy you have for your workforce, your health insurance decisions, and pretty much what everything else. But at the end of the day, all of it still points to a strong demand for the staffing industry in the future. Again, it goes back to those points I made earlier. You should still be able to be a less expensive option for a labor uh, workforce, you know, from where your client standpoint is. Very important. Last but not least, make sure your healthcare vendor or broker has experience in the staffing industry and understands its unique challenges. And make sure they're going to be providing the expertise and the solutions you need. Because at the end of the day, there are no unicorns. Use common sense. If someone's promising you, oh, well, you have a below 50% employer contribution, it's going to be dirt cheap and you don't have to get anybody rolled and it's going to get you out of the law. Use your common sense. Those plans do not exist, certainly from the major carriers uh, in the nation. We've been having those conversations uh, for the past two years. It is not there yet. All right. From there, that's pretty much well uh, it. Uh, so the floor is now open for questions. Wonderful, and, uh, John. We've had yeah. a number come in, so I'm going to start reading these off for you if you're okay with that. Okay, sure. All right. So the first one we had come through, what if you pay vacation and holiday pay at a flat rate and not hourly? Would you have to figure the flat rate divided into hours? Well, that's a good technical question. My, you know, I'm going to have to give you my best educated guess, and that guess is yes. Um, uh, the way they look at it is if you do vacation pay, they want those hours factored in. 
Mm-hmm. But again, the only thing we're really counting, we're not counting the actual wage, we're just counting the number of hours. So I guess uh, uh, base that on a normal work week for that employee. Okay, great. So the next question is, do we have to use the exact first and last day of the month, or can we say February of 2012 was February 6th through March 2nd? Four weeks oh, Monday through Friday. Yeah, very very good question. The look back rule you can set any twelve month or, or number of month period that you want. Um, just so my head doesn't explode, we use the the, the calendar year example because that's the you know in my mind the easiest way to explain it. But yeah, you can have uh, as long as it's twelve consecutive calendar months, you can start and finish your look back period any way you choose. But but again, for new hires, well they're Initial measurement periods will start on their start date. What happens if an employee works for 10 months during the 12-month look-back period, for example, January 1st through October 31st, exceeds the 1,560 hours, and then is no longer employed as of the end of the 12-month look-back period? You don't count them. All right. That is the key to the rule. If they are not an employee after that 12 months, they haven't worked on that the last two two months of the year, whatever the assignment was, they're not counted. Now, the tricky part comes in, what if they have a month's break in service in between? They do 12 they do still do 10 months. They still only uh they didn't work 2 months of the 12-month period, but that was sometime earlier. Okay? The, now that's going to be tricky. You actually probably will have to count that employee because they hit the 1560 hours and he, he's still an employee after 12 months. Okay. All right. Um, next question. If a contractor is hired on January 1st, 2014, ended his assignment on June 30th, 2014, but was rehired two months later on September 1st, 2014, do we use the January start date or the September start date for purposes of calculating the 12-month period? Ah, he's going to hate me. That is yet to be determined. <laughs> ASA is, is working very hard to get uh, labor to clarify or issue a new ruling on what the length of employment has to be or the length of non-employment, I should say, or should there be some at least minimum hour requirement that an employee has to to meet in a month's time? Um, so, yeah, very good question there. The jury is still out on that. Um, and this kind of goes back to some of the things, uh, questions, you know, we get that question, a very similar question like that all the time. And one of my things is depending on what they come out with, whether you know, employees have to work a minimum set of hours or they have to be technically off assignment for a certain length of time. Another way to look at it is, is, is one of the things we know about the staffing industry is staffing companies rarely officially tem- terminate employees. Just like you, most of you know, uh, that employee may come back at a later time and want you know, another assignment at some point. So staffing companies generally don't go through an official termination product, uh, process. Well, that is one of those things in my mind that is out there that may actually end up taking place, that when an employee is off assignment, you may have to just based on the rules and regulation, go ahead and officially terminate that employee. So there's a lot of questions there that are yet to be answered. Very good question. The, uh, the honest answer is we don't know yet because they haven't ruled on that yet. All right, we have another question here that uh, the person who posed it said that you answered it, but I thought it would be a good question to ask sure. this for everyone else to hear. It says, can small companies, less than 50, still offer a regular plan to internal employees only, or would we have to offer to everyone? A great question. If, if you're you know, under the 50 full-time equivalents and you're deemed to be in small, a small employer, you're pretty much well off the hook from the, the health care reform law. So unless I would say the only thing that would throw a a wrench into the works on that would be if uh you know they came out with non-discrimination rules and they made that apply to small employers as well. Um but you know based on the way things are now, the way the rules are now, I think that person will be fine to continue doing business the way they they're doing it because at the end of the day you're a small employer and healthcare reform doesn't apply to you. Next question, and we have several here, so hopefully you don't mind. We're just going to keep going through all these. 
Um, That's can all you right. Clarify, Keep going. Okay. Can you clarify what you mean by saying not offering health care? Do we as employers have to participate in paying the premiums, or do we just have to offer the benefit? Very good question. Now we're going to start getting to a, a you know a little bit of the the legal points and fencing on this. The way the law is written, the way the law is written is you cover your requirement by the law by making offering of coverage. So that is correct. However, this is a, uh, you know something we've been trying to educate folks for a while to get that coverage. Now listen, we're not talking about just you know an AFLAC plan or something like that. You know, uh, or, or you know, so it has to be full blown qualified health plan, major med coverage. Well, at this point, no carrier in the country is going to write you without a minimum participation requirement. Now, that may vary slightly from state to state, but the the, the program we've developed for major med, and, and we use uh, the absolute best stop loss carriers, most highly reputable, um, you know, uh, and our administrator has been affiliated with uh, the Blue Cross family. Those uh, plans all are going to require a 75% participation requirement. The national carriers we are talking to now, they're not backing off on that. And the second thing you got to remember in that is one of my earlier points on uh, 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 the carrier requirements. Okay, we're identifying new, basically a new pool of employees with very little claims history. Okay. So we're talking about, and a carrier is talking about covering a new pool of employees that you can't go and say, okay, here's my previous plan that these all these folks were carry, uh, covered under, and here's my past three years of claims experience. I don't see very many, if any, staffing companies having that claims experience data, data to share with carriers. Okay, We at Essential Staff Care are very lucky because we have years of claims experience for this market. So this is why we were able to get a plan, uh, you know, uh, a major uh, med qualified, but it's going to come with a lot of certain restrictions. Again, they're not going to play a lot of ball, especially the, the national reputable carriers. Those participation requirements are going to stand. And what's going to happen just from an actuarial standpoint is when you're looking at a pool of employees that you do not have three years of claims history on, well, they're like, okay, we'll write it, but your rate's going to go up. That's how they deal with that when they don't have adequate claims history. How much it's going to go up, we do not know yet. Next question is uh, fairly specific. It says, my only office is in Virginia. My employee lives in Maryland and works in D.C. Which state plan do they have to get if we provide an acceptable form of coverage for our employees? Well, good question. Um, uh, <laughs> it is going to, you're going to have a number of choices there. We're talking about I'm just a little curious. We're talking about one single employee here? That's the way the question was worded. Okay, yeah, I would just say talk to a local broker and, and grab an individual plan for that person. That would be the, you know, the simplest thing. Um it's going to be very hard again. Group underwriting requirements are going to apply here. Um our carriers that we're developing our our MEC program for the staffing industry it's going to be basically for the mid to larger size employees. They got to have about 150 full time employees. Uh, anything less than that, they just know the rates go up higher. So, um, you know, when it comes, we're talking about one single uh, employee, you're going to have to look at probably individual plans there. Those tend to be very expensive. Uh, and then anything under 50 employees is generally the small group market. So, you know, you're going to have some uh, uh, issues there as well. Okay. Do we know if the government is going to define certain plans as quote unquote Cadillac plans and are they going to tax employers who provide that level of coverage to internal employees? Yes, uh you know, most of our focus is is basically on the staffing industry where these quote unquote Cadillac plans you don't, you know, see a whole lot of those uh, uh out there, but yes, there are supposed to be taxes and penalties uh based on quote unquote Cadillac plans. Next question is, um, I have a government contract and many of the employees that work on this contract are military dependents or retired military. 
They have benefits with the government. Will they count towards full-time employees? Most of them choose not to take my benefits because they have medical coverage through the government. Absolutely right. So here, there, you've got a couple of ways to look at this, and it depends of whether or not you're going to pay or to play. All right. In a situation like that, I would advise to play, try to get something, because you know that, that a, the number of those employees aren't really going to have to take the coverage because they're already covered through a, some type of government program or, or some other type of, uh, of employer-sponsored program. So if someone is already covered, you don't have to worry about them. You know they're not going to sign up for your plan and, and you get a free pass. If you pay in that scenario, you have to pay on all full-timers regardless of whether or not they get coverage. So that is a, a very important part of the decision to be made there. Next question is, in calculating the full-time equivalence, do I take the total hours worked and divide by 12, or do I only count the hours up to 120 worked by an employee? For example, 25 employees work 240 hours per month for 12 months. Would this count as 72 72,000 hours or 36,000 hours towards the small slash large calculation? I, I would just say just start easy. Count up all your hours in a given month. Just add your full-time hours plus your part-time hours. If for any uh, particular employees or employee class gets over that 120, just cap their number at 120. Add up the total numbers for the month. Divide the, the month by 120. Do that calculation each month for the 12 months. Then total up your uh, full-time equivalents for each month, and then just divide that total by 12. That's the way the IRS says to do it, and and you know, so just you know, just start small, just you know, figure out what one month is. Your payroll vendor should be able to help you with that. If a client hires a part-time employee on their own, are they considered regular by the government and eligible for coverage? Now, uh, if a client hires a regular person on their own. It basically is going to be who's the employer record. Okay. Next yeah, so basically your clients will deal with only their employees that are under their, you know, company Fed tax ID number. Your temporary employees, you know, you're responsible for them because you're the employer record for them. Next question, could national companies put us out of business if they have to offer superior coverage and we opt to not offer it? Well, it's it's a good question. Um, you know, the national companies are going to have an advantage because they're going to be able to have a much larger workforce to spread their costs around on. But then again, that's always been the case between the nationals and everybody else. You know, because of their, you know, uh, economies of scale, they're able to spread their costs a little bit bigger. Again, how does a small guy beat a big guy? Yeah, niche markets. You do it. You do it your normal way. Your service. Um, you know they like you. You're in business, and you've been competing with the large nationals all this time anyway. Uh, I don't really see that is is being a big differentiator, but it all depends on what type of clients you're going after as well. Um, that's why it's very important. It's like, okay, talk to your clients. What is it you want? Do you want these people covered? If you do, it's going to cost X amount. Do you want the cheapest possible price? Well, I still got to raise your prices, but it, it's only going to go up this much. Okay. Uh, this question says, how do you count full-time employees who are covered under their spouse's plan? Now, for the purpose of the large or small calculation, none of that matters. The only thing, again, you're looking at is hours. All right. When it comes to doing your look-back rule and identifying your full-time employees, who they actually are, well, like I said, if you decide to pay, the law is you pay on every full-time employee. You don't even worry about coverage, less the first 30, okay? Subtract the first 30. If you got 50, you're only paying the penalty on 20. If you do decide to play, you have to offer – coverage on it. You have to offer coverage to everybody, but again, that employee is already covered, so they shouldn't take your plan, and you won't be penalized for that employee. Another question here that's come in, do we calculate hours for salaried employees as well? Yes, you, do, uh, you cap them at 120 for the month. Okay. 
Um, instead of offering the insurance, does the law allow you to give the employee money to use to pay for their own insurance? Yeah, now we're getting into some uh, things called basically called what you call a defined contribution. Let's say, let's put it, the example in the question this way. Let's say you're offering coverage. You're kicking in a couple of hundred bucks a month to somebody's plan. Well, you decide, okay, well, I'm not, I can't, you know, afford to offer this coverage to all the new full-timers now. So because of the non-discrimination rules, I'm going to end up having to drop the plan. Well, that's pretty much, well, your cause an employer to make that employee whole, uh, that is the right thing to do, but I don't think there's anything in the law that requires you to do that. But, you know, if you're paying 200 bucks a month on their plan or more or something to that effect and you decide to cancel it and not give that boy a $200 a month raise, you're going to have some angry employees to deal with. Okay. Um, another question here, is the pay or play option an annual election? Good question. Um, I, the way we're looking at it is you're able to go through it. Uh, there is really no clarification on that. Let's say you start out the year paying the penalty but uh, decide to start playing later on. The, the penalties are calculated monthly. So the only thing, you know, you have to go through your reporting requirements and all that stuff. Um, I, there's nothing in the law that I've seen that says it matters when you do it or if you do it or whatever. The only thing they care about is whether or not you pay or play, and that can be up to you, and I'm sure that could change at any time. You could decide to play, decide, okay, this isn't working, I'm paying, or the, or do the reverse, and I think you would be fine at any time during the year at this point. If we offer insurance and pay any portion of the premium, do we receive a tax credit for all those money spent on employer contributions to the employee's health insurance? Absolutely. Um, your your employer contributions, and that is going to be the big decision that everybody has to make. We're going to have to do a little bit of math here. Is your employer contribution, they, uh, you know, even with the tax deductibility, more or less than what the penalty is going to be. Like I said, the financial one is just one part of the question. So, um, yes, let's say the average cost of a health plan is around 500 bucks a month. Now, that is that is actually less than, than the uh, Kaiser Family Report uh, that we displayed again, but that was that was across the nation. But let's say you're, uh, you know, uh, for an individual covered just 500 bucks a month. Typically, that is split a third, two third from employer employee. Means you're kicking in about 350 a month. Employees kicking about 150 a month. All right, your 350 a month that you're writing a check for is tax deductible. All right, so you're going to have to factor what the deductibility is and what your real or whatever cost is. Your penalty, if you don't pay the coverage on that, uh, if you don't provide coverage, that employee is 166.67. It's non-deductible, but it's so you got to figure out whether or not 350 deductible in that example is more or less than 166.67 non-deductible, and that's going to factor into your decision. Another one here, the government contracts require us to pay $3.71 an hour for health and welfare. Do you foresee the government changing that requirement to actually offer the insurance, or will they keep the dollar amount requirement? Good question. I do not have a very specific answer, but I'm going to tell you what, you know, what, I, what I, I really think. I think based on the law, the law covers all employers. Now, if there's a specific exclusion out there for government contracts, I don't know and I'm not aware of it. So I'm going to assume at this point the law is the law, and that means the you know uh, whatever the hourly payment toward their benefits, you're kind of stuck on the pay or play. But I would probably talk to an attorney about that because you know we really don't know. I haven't seen anything, nor have we heard anything from ASA on that, or if there's anything specific addressing government contractors. Does overtime count towards the 1,560 hours look back? Yes, hours are hours. Got it. Is there a minimum annual salary amount which disqualifies employers from offering health care regardless of their hours? Well, now we're going to talk about the Medicaid situation. Okay. 
and it's going to vary depending on whether you pay or play. If you're within 138% of the federal poverty level, you are qualified now for the new Medicaid expansion, all right? Meaning if you offer a plan, you're playing, and you have employees that are enrolled in Medicaid, you don't have to worry about them, okay? You know, on the other hand, if you're paying, it doesn't matter. It's the only thing that matters is whether or not they're full-time. That is the main difference, all right? If you're paying, you got to do full-time regardless. You're just paying on full-times. If you are, are playing, then if and people are enrolled in other coverage, you don't have to worry about them logging on to your plan because that's how you're paying is your employer contribution, all right? That being said, the new Supreme Court support the uh, excuse me I'm losing it here. The new Supreme Court decision that would just recently pass down this summer left it up to the state decide uh, to decide whether or not they're going to expand their Medicaid. And there's quite a number of states that said they're no longer going to expand that Medicaid uh, their Medicaid rolls to that 138 percent. So that causes a very big question now because if, if let's say, North Carolina and South Carolina, North Carolina decides to expand its Medicaid uh, roles, but South Carolina does not, all right? What happens in that case uh, that an employee has that available to them in North Carolina but does, does not in South Carolina? So I certainly expect probably some more court cases to come out of that decision, um, it really does remain to be seen. But to answer that particular question, you know, um, again, if you're play, if you're paying and not offering coverage, it doesn't matter what they're covered on. The only thing that matters is whether or not they're full time or not. If you're playing and going to offer coverage, then that person is not supposed to enroll in your plan. If we get an offer coverage but don't have seventy five percent participation, where does that leave us? Ah, let me explain how group health insurance works. Very good question. You have what's called an open enrollment. The carrier requires a 75% participation. The way the national carriers do it is you must enroll first during your open enrollment period, and that's when they're checking the whether or not to see if you hit the 75% participation. If you do not, they have the right to rescind the policy. So that's why everybody has to be very careful in the decision they're going to make based on their clients. All right. Uh, our president gave a presentation to the South Carolina Hospitality Association a few weeks ago. These are all restaurants and hotels up and down, uh, you know, South Carolina. All right. Their business model is totally different. He made a very important point there to that audience that I'm going to relate to you here because uh, we do an, uh, another vertical market for the hospitality. A restaurant or hotel, if they make a mistake saying, okay, I'm going to offer coverage and it doesn't work out and the policy ends, it really is not going to affect a restaurant or a hotel. People are still going to go stay at the hotel. People are still going to eat at the restaurant. However, if you're a staffing company and you're promising all of your clients, I'm going to have a policy, and they're counting on that, and that's what your market and your clients need, and you don't hit your 75% participation rate and the product gets yanked, you've now got to go to explain to all your clients why you no longer have a policy. It could, it, so that's why, you know, think long and hard about which way you're going to go and what market you're in because it's going to vary between staffing company and staffing company and market to market. Uh, next question here is, if we play, what percentage of the premium will we need to pay? All right. There, once you start playing, you get all the other fund rules to deal with. And there's a new, another fund rule called the affordability test. That means for the individual coverage, thank God they didn't rule it to family coverage because that would have pretty much well made everybody drop their health coverage. But you're supposed to, the employee's portion of the premium is not supposed to be higher than 9.5%, basically say 10% of their annual W-2 rate uh, wages. That is the safe harbor you use when deciding what your employer contribution is. 
because if their portion of the premium is higher than 9.5%, then they are eligible for a subsidy from the exchange because of the affordability rule. If they go to the exchange and apply for coverage and receive a subsidy, then you are taxed $250 per month per employee for every employee uh, that does not, that re- goes and receives a subsidy. Now, a lot of people say, you know, well, uh, you're probably not going to have that many people go to subsidies. Well, I'm not going to speak to that one way or the other. I'm just going to stick to what the law is. If, you, if your employer contribution, uh, that employee is paying more than 9.5% of their W-2 wages with you. doesn't matter if they have any other jobs. Your only safe harbor is the W-2 wages with you. Uh, when forming your employer con- uh, contribution, that employee is eligible for a subsidy. If he receives one, you are now taxed $250 a month or $3,000 per year on the, every employee that receives a subsidy. How does this affect payroll employees? For example, the client sends someone to the temporary temporary agency for purpose of simply paying the payroll for that employee. Bill rates reduced because they don't recruit or um, interview the employee, and the employee is not covered under the temporary agency's benefits. Would the agency still count payroll employees in their full-time count? Uh, It goes back to the employer record question. Who, who, what company does that employee actually work for? Got it. The answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. In determining full-time equivalents, do you exclude known full-time employees' hours in the calculation? You're just supposed to cap their hours at 120 for the count. You know, um, if they're full-time, you just say, okay, I got 10 full-time people. That's 120 hours each for each employee. I got I got a hundred part time folks, and I just got to figure out what their hours are. When you're dividing your monthly hourly count by the 120, every full time person is basically going to end up being a one to one. Okay. Um, I think you may have already answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Does the law define the percent or amount per employee? The employer is required to pay toward their MEC, or is the employer just required to offer a plan? you got two things uh, to worry about there. That first is the affordability rule that we're just worried about. So your employer contribution has to be uh, uh, substantial enough that it doesn't exceed 9.5% of the employee's W-2 wages on a single uh, individual policy. Uh, but then you're also going to have to deal with the carrier's requirements on that. Your carrier is going to tell you how much – you know, you've got to kick in or they're not going to write the plan. That's all part of the quoting process. Okay. If we are clearly a small employer, to what extent will we have to report to the government to prove it? I would, um, I don't really know how you report that yet, but I'm sure the IRS is going to let you know. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant about that, but uh, basically, yeah, uh, just hold on to your count, hold on to your hourly uh, uh, records just to make sure you've got everything in place to prove that you're 49.9 full-time equivalent or less. Um, I'm not really uh, that familiar other than the the only reporting requirements we're dealing with right now is the stuff that goes on the W-2 as a carrier standpoint. Um, when it comes to what employers have to report, when it comes to that, I'm not really familiar with how that works yet. We've just got a couple more questions here, John, and then I think we can probably wrap up. Um, okay. Corporate employees are more stable than temporary employees. If all full-time employees must be offered insurance, the participation of the temp employees may not be enough to get insurance for all your employees. Then what? That's one of those struggles that, that the staffing industry in particular is going to have to go through on this. The good news is the look-back rule finally gave carriers, insurance carriers, a more stable workforce to look at. So they are now at least considering um, those employees for coverage where during the previous rule, uh, without the look-back rule, the carriers were never going to touch it, okay, because carriers like to see low turnover, 
uh, an average tenure of about three years, uh, you know, for employees, and they're looking for that previous three years of claims experience, okay? This is going to be a new market for them. There's probably going to be very uh, little claim experience in most cases. Again, in most cases, uh, there's going to be very little claims experience for that new pool of employees. So we expect that to kind of tick up uh, uh, premiums a little bit for that little nugget of information right there. And you're still, even though you may have long-term employees, it really is going to depend on what their turnover is. We still may be looking at a 100 150% turnover for those longer-term workforce. That's still higher than carriers like, so they still tend to jack up premiums a tiny bit based on that. So the only thing we're telling folks is go, go, you know, uh, over the next year or so, once you've identified who the employees you're trying to trying to cover, uh, uh, shop it out there and see. Okay. Uh, one more question here, John, and then I think we can wrap this up. What happens if we offer and an employee will choose not to participate in our plan? Will we as the employer be penalized? Very good question, um, and, and again, that is one of those things that have yet to be defined. We do know if the employee is previously covered under some other type plan, that is something that they're going to have to sign and, and say, hey, I'm already covered, so I decline your coverage. There hasn't been really a whole lot of guidance on that employee says, I don't like your plan, I don't like the company you chose, or I don't care how much it costs, I think it's too expensive and I'm not taking it any reason. Really hasn't been a whole lot of guidance on what happens in, in that case there. So, um, you know, that's one of those things that's going to be a little bit hard to answer. Again, you may get into discrimination rules because, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're going to be talking to employees. Uh, you know, uh, we had uh, some questions on the previous webinar. Somebody says, well, what if I just start asking anybody if they're covered? Well, we got to kind of wait and see how all that stuff shakes out. Another thing to keep in mind is for the larger, mid-sized and larger staffing firms. If you have over 200 full-time people on your payroll, then you're supposed to be subjected to the automatic enrollment provision which means if you've offered a plan, you're supposed to automatically enroll those people. So, and, and how the ins and outs of that's supposed to work hasn't really been fleshed out either, especially in regards to those questions when it comes to declining coverage. Because, you know, we don't really know, hey, we, we're going to automatically enroll them, but this employee's over here screaming, I don't want it, I don't want it. Well, it's, it's not been quite figured out yet how to deal with that. Uh, we expect a lot of new changes over the next coming months. All right. Well, thank you so very much for all of that extra information, going through all of those questions, John. I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank our participants in today's webinar, as well as John, for sharing his knowledge about the Affordable Care Act. The recording of this webinar will be available on our website, www.tricom.com backslash resources. If you have any questions or would like the webinar recording, please feel free to contact either John or us here at TRICOM, thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. And uh, Thanks, John's everyone. contact information is up here, so uh, feel free to email him directly. We also have a short poll. If you um, would please take time to uh, answer a couple of short questions for us, it does help us uh, in content for the following webinars. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks.